One thing that I love from the word of God is that it has a lot, it has a lot of things um, that we learn from. And there's a lot of objects that, that we can learn from. And I've actually started working on a whole list of objects that we can learn from, from the word that are still in our lives today. And that's the cool thing about God's creation is that the things that he talks about in his word, um, as we go through our daily lives, we can see those objects. So, you know, the Lord in his word, he, he put in things in nature, you know, water, grass, trees, rocks. Um, today, I'm going to talk about feathers and wings. And so just a lot of objects in the Bible that I think that as you, as anyway, when I read about them, I like to figure out where they are in the rest of the Bible and how God is teaching us through objects in nature and just objects everywhere. Um, this last weekend, I was privileged to be with my sister and we went to Colorado. Uh, well, she lives in Colorado now. And she took us to, she drove us to uh, the top of a mountain, 15,500 feet, um, Pikes Peak. And we were so high that you couldn't even see the, the tree line. And I was, when we got up there, all I could think was, God made all of this. You know, man, man couldn't make that mountain. Man could not make um, what I could see from 15,000 feet up in the air. And I, I don't know, I'm just really, um, I'm just really drawn to that part of scripture that the Lord, I, I think that what it means to me is that I go through my daily life sometimes and I get so busy that I forget to remember that God made all of the things that I can see. And if God didn't make the things then he made the people with the brains to make the things right. And I think that that part of, of God and that part of his just amazing creation, it makes me realize even how much bigger God is than I remember that he is on a daily basis. And so I was thinking about teaching today and nothing else that I thought of um, really felt right. And I, I want you to approach this study about wings and feathers today in a way that to help you understand that God is always with us and that Every time we see things in nature, you know, the leaves, I'm sure the leaves have all pretty much fallen. I've been to Finland in the fall, um, but by now I'm sure the leaves have all fallen and the trees are starting to look wintry. Um, in Oklahoma, we're not quite there yet. Uh, the leaves are still falling and we're still having, you know, nice days like today's in the 60s. But <clears throat> Throughout this lesson, I just want you to realize that God shows us through his creation and through nature of how much he loves us. And when I realize how much he loves us and all the things that he's made, I realize that he is ever present with me and that I can, I can truly trust him um, because he's given me all these reminders as I go throughout the day to help me remember that he, he is so big and he created all the things and I, I can trust a God who created a mountain, you know, that's 15,000 feet. And I can trust a God who made feathers on birds and wings. And I know it's a really simple concept today, but um, I, I just think that sometimes, you know, simple is, is better. And so we're going to dive right in. Okay, so this is what we're going to start with. We're going to start with Psalm 91. And I know that last year, especially last year, a lot of people really read Psalm 91 a lot and depended upon Psalm 91. And I remember um, 
my husband's pastor and his wife, um, they felt like that Psalm 91 was so important. And I remember um, when we had some some global um, unrest things like in the Gulf and in Iraq uh, back years ago um, with some of the terrorism and things. I remember back then people really, you know, running to Psalm 91 and it, it's, to me, it's like a Psalm, like Psalm 23. And when there's trouble, it's something that we can always run to and we can always find comfort. And I'm just going to really think about the first four verses today. If you have your Bible, um, I would love it if you would actually um, go through these verses with me with your Bible. And if you don't have them marked, I encourage you to mark them. Or if you have a phone and you can look at them, um, if you're, you can multitask Zoom and your Bible app at the same time to highlight them. Um, so I'm just going to read the first four verses and hopefully you're reading it from your Bible and make sure that you mark these because I'm going to give you a lot of verses today here on the PowerPoint. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God and him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Now, we're just going to kind of go through this, not kind of, we are going to go through it, um, verse by verse. And the thing I want you to remember from verse one is, um, there's, I didn't put this on the PowerPoint, but there's an important word in there, abide. And if you think about the word abide, I'm going to go over here to, um, I didn't put this on the PowerPoint, but John 15, and Jesus is, this is all in red letters here, John 15, and to me, I call this the abiding chapter, and it, again, the Lord is using pieces from his creation to teach us, so he's using um, vines, and he's using branches, and he's using fruit to teach us concepts. Um, to help us understand how much he loves us and how much he cares for us. And in John 15, there's a principle that if we abide in him, um, you know, the only place that, that we can really, um, I don't know, there's just, I, I don't want to get down in the weeds of abiding um, today, but, you know, the Lord says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And sometimes when I, I over the years, you know, think that, you know, I, I'm pretty smart and I can accomplish things. Then I read that verse and I remember, oh yeah, um, the Lord said without him, then I'm nothing. And that's not to be contradictory. You know, it's not to say that the Lord doesn't love me, but he's trying to get me to a place of this secret place and remembering that only in him do I abide and only in him is my hiding place. And, you know, I don't know if it's true in Finland, but here in North America, there's a phrase, you know, like the beach is my happy place or, um, you know, my home is my happy place. And I, I think that as people that serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, we need to realize that our happy place or our, we, when we say that, you know, we need to realize that only in him can we hide and only in him can we, only through Jesus Christ can we be truly happy. Um, and we can't find that in anything outside of his word and anything outside of his love. And so our secret place, our hiding place has to be you know, we have to learn that we dwell in that secret place of the Most High because there is a principle in Psalm 91 that, again, the principles of God, if we do this, then God will do this. And he said that he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So 
I have to be willing to dwell in that secret place. And I have to be willing to make God my hiding place and make his word my hiding place. And a lot of times I know myself, you know, I, I've run to, um, and I'll just use silly examples, you know, um, you know, when I'm stressed out, I, I run to chocolate or when I'm stressed out, I run to, you know, coffee or hot tea. And I know those are silly examples, but I, I think that God is trying to tell us through Psalm 91 that the only way that we're going to get verse two, three, and four is to put verse one into perspective and into place in our lives. And so if I'm not dwelling in the secret place of the most high, um, then there's no way that I can abide in the shadow of the almighty. And so the secret place has to be our hiding place. And then some verses here, um, Psalm 119, 114, the Lord, he's reminding us again that he is our hiding place and he is our shield. And then Psalm 143, 9, I'm going to read that to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you, I take shelter. So again, we're talking today about the Lord's feathers and his wings and abiding in him and staying in that secret place with him and that hiding place. And to me, that hiding place is starting every day in the word, starting every day in prayer. And if you start, you know, that's the first principle, um, the principle of first that Terry Shock always talks about. Um, but he, I, when we put that principle to work, once I start out the day in my secret place and I hide in the Lord's presence and I allow the Lord to, you know, I'm, I'm underneath the shadow of the Almighty and I'm dwelling in that secret place and then he is going to shelter me and do what he promised he would do. And then Psalm 31, 20 um, says, you shall hide them in the secret place of your presence. And so again, just over and over the Lord telling us that in his presence is got to be our secret place. And in his presence has got to be the place that we hide. And we turn to him um, in all manner of things. And then verse two, I will save the Lord. This is verse two of Psalm 91. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him, I will trust. So remember in verse one, the Lord is giving us the principle that we're supposed to dwell in the secret place, of the most high. And if we do, we will, we shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. And then verse two says, I can say then, he is my refuge and my fortress, but I have chosen to put myself under his shadow. I have chosen to put myself to abide in his presence, and I have chosen to remain by under him. And, um, you know, to me, verse two, when I say that he is my refuge, he is my fortress, then I'm saying that, okay, Lord, you're the person, you're the thing, your, your presence is what I'm going to go to when I, when things are shaking around me, when there's a storm around me and any, and I'm going to talk about the storm again in a minute, but, um, you know, when I'm in that refuge, that place of refuge, and when God is my fortress, just think about a fortress, you know, it would be like a, a castle or this large place where people go in to take shelter. Think about medieval days, um, you know, when there were castles with moats and, you know, the soldiers on the, on the edges, you know, at the lookouts. And when we hide in God and we stay in his word and in his presence, then we are in, he's our fortress and he is protecting us from everything that's going on around us. And just imagine yourself, um, if feathers and wings are not helping you today, then imagine yourself, you know, with verse two of he's your refuge, he's your fortress. He is that strong tower. I didn't put that verse on here, but that would work. Um, you know, he's that strong tower that we run to and we are safe in him. And also I think of verse two, when I say my God in him, I will trust. You know, I think that we as 
um, apostolics, we as Holy Ghost filled people, we throw the word trust in God around pretty loosely. And I don't think it's until we have to trust in God that we really find that we trust in God because we can say that we trust in God, but until we have to, until life, you know, the storms come and, and, and all the craziness happens, then that's when we realize that he is who he says he is and that I can have absolute faith and trust in God because I've learned that I can't worry and pray at the same time. And a lot of times I find myself, if I'm, you know, if I find something kind of circling around my brain and like in a day and I find myself kind of, you know, allowing that thought just to keep coming. And I realize that instead of taking it to prayer, I can say I'm not worrying about it. But if I keep thinking about it and wondering how I am going to fix it or wondering how I'm going to control it or wondering how I'm going to get myself out, you know, then what I'm doing is I'm, I'm worrying about it. And so it's impossible to worry and pray at the same time. And then Psalm 2, 12 says, blessed are those who put their trust in him. So when we trust him enough to remain in his shadow, and when we trust him enough to remain in his fortress, then we are blessed. When we put our trust in him, we are blessed. And I want to be blessed. Amen. I know that you all want to be blessed. And so the Lord is saying a way to get blessed even more is to stay in his refuge and to stay in his place of safety. And Dr. James Hughes is a apostolic minister. He lives in North America here in Texas. And he has a concept that he says that all good relationships have three things. They have talk, trust, and touch. And he says that if relationships are dysfunctional, all or just one of those three could be missing and that relationship could be dysfunctional. And so I want you to think about it with the Lord. Um, he's talking about it from a family aspect because he, he counsels a lot of families in North America and I'm sure through his computer all over the world. But this is his, his principle about families. And I always think it's so true about the Lord too. You know, the people that we spend a lot of time talking to our trust grows with them, right? And then the people that we spend a lot of time talking to, we trust them, then it's easy to touch them. So think about a family relationship. You know, I can hug my son, my son towers over me, you know, but I can still, you know, I talk to my son and I trust my son. Um, and like my mother, you know, I, I talk to her, I trust her. Um, so I, I touch her, you know, I, I hug her, I touch her arm, I touch her hand. And thinking about that with the Lord, if I don't talk to the Lord a lot, then it's hard for me to trust the Lord, right? And then if I am not trusting the Lord, then it's hard for me to feel like I can touch the Lord. Because remember, if any one of those three things are missing, then my relationship is dysfunctional. And I don't want to have a dis dysfunctional relationship with the Lord. I want to be able to talk to him, to trust him, and to feel like that I can touch him and for his presence to touch me. Now, I have some photos on here. They're just stock photos um, somewhere. Hang on. I'm going to move. I want to show you. So I just want, I'm going to skip ahead, then I'll go back. Um, I wanted you to think about feathers and wings today. And these are just some stock photos. I don't own any ducks or chickens or anything. I don't own any of these things. Um, but my neighbors have chickens and they're always squawking and the rooster is always announcing the day, even until it gets nighttime. I think the rooster's a little bit confused, but I want you to think about this concept of wings and feathers as I go. Um, about this, this little, um, I don't know if it's a duck or a chicken or what it is, but I want you to think about our relationship with the Lord. And when we are 
in his refuge. And I just wanted you to have that image in your head. I'm going the wrong way here. Let me go back. Um, so I want you to have that image in your head because I want you to remember that we're talking about feathers and wings. Um, okay, so verse three. Verse three is, surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. I was checking my time, see what time it is. So if, remember, I think that Psalm 91 is conditional, which means that the Lord expects me to do my part before I expect him to do his part. And I think the word is very conditional, a lot of things. And so a lot of times I think, well, Lord, I can't feel your presence or Lord, where are you? Or, you know, whatever. And then I remember, oh, um, well, I didn't spend a lot of time talking to the Lord this morning. I didn't talk long enough to have trust. And I didn't talk to him long enough to feel like I had touched him and I felt his presence and I felt that peace and I didn't go and remain in the shadow you know of the almighty and I didn't make him my refuge and my fortress today and I am not abiding under the shadow of the almighty and I didn't dwell in the secret place and so when I get to verse three it's easy to say, Lord, but you said you're going to deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. And it's not that the Lord is saying, gotcha, because I don't believe that. But I feel like that with the Lord, you know, he's telling us what to do to be in that safe place with him, to tell us what we can do to remain in a place that we are covered by his feathers and his wings. But sometimes I feel like we take ourselves out of that. We take ourselves out of his presence and, and we remove ourselves. Um, and I won't go into all the ways that you can do that, but you know, the principle of that is Genesis three, when Adam and Eve removed themselves from the presence of the Lord and they violated what the Lord told them that they had to do. And so then their, con their connection with him was severed and I'll just leave it right there. I won't get into that. That's a whole lesson for another day. So verse three, talking about verse three, the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Now the snare is a trap. And in the New Testament in 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 27, I think that this verse is so good. And I, I, I'm going to read you from either, I think it's from the New Living Translation this verse and the servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all able to teach patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare or the trap of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Now, when I read this verse, I get this sense that Remember, Timothy was written to people who were saints of God, who had the Holy Ghost, and who were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, right? And so these were people who were in the church. But Timothy is telling them that they must not quarrel, but they must be gentle. They must be able to teach, and they must be patient. And I don't like being patient. Um, patient is hard, especially when you're waiting on God to do something, right? Patience is just horrible. Um, in your patience, possess you your souls. My mother would always say that. And I was like, oh, stop it. Stop it. I don't want to hear that. Stop it. I don't want to be patient. Um, so, but we're supposed to be patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God will perhaps grant them repentance. So I'm thinking that we need repentance if we've got all these other things going on and that they may know the truth. Now, again, these people we're in the church. But Timothy is saying, if you've got all this going on, then you need to repent so that you may know the truth maybe again, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare or the trap of the devil, having been taken captive by him, the devil, to do the devil's will. There's another translation. If you read this, I think it's in the message um, paraphrase. And it says that something like, um, when we are, when we, 
when we take the bait, and this is from the bait of Satan um, about offense, but when we take the bait, then Satan has laid a trap for us, usually offense or usually, um, well, it's a lot of things, but um, so we, there's a, there's a bait and there's a trap and we, we take it. The message paraphrase says that we are, we run the devil's errands. You know, I'm like, oh no, I, I don't like that guy. You know, I, I'm not going to be ever running his errands. And so when I realize that the Lord will deliver me from the snare, the fowler, and from the perilous pestilence, I've got to remember that there is snares for us. There are snares. And, you know, I don't want to give the devil any more glory, but there is an enemy that seeks, you know, to devour us and seeks to do whatever he can to destroy us, just to help us destroy our credibility, our witness, all those things. And so you've got to be really careful because there is a fowler, you know, there is a trapper, there is a hunter, and there is a perilous pestilence that is trying to harm us. But remember, verses one and two, the Lord wants us to remain in that safe place, in the refuge, in, in the... Um, let's see my word, in the fortress, and the Lord is wanting us um, to remain in there, and then if we're remaining there, then we can be delivered from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence, um, so that's verse three. I hope this is all making sense. This makes sense in my head, but I don't know if it makes sense in your head, <laughs> so that's why I need to see some of your faces to say, for me to look and say, are they looking at me like, what is going on, or is this making sense? Um, so don't fall into the trap of the enemy from 2 Timothy 2.24, um, because then you'll need to repent, and then you'll need to know the truth again, and you'll need to come to your senses, okay? So if you fall down, and you forget all these things, and you get out from underneath the fortress, then you gotta crawl back. You know, sometimes I tell people, let me move back so I can do this. Sometimes if you find yourself outside the fortress, you know, the army crawl, the soldiers, you know, you just grab a hold of the rocks and you just start crawling back, you know, as fast as you can get, you know, you might have to army crawl your way back, but you got to get back. Okay. Um, I just want to show you this because um, a couple years ago, I had uh, an artist in the church that we pastored. She created this for me. Um, and I... I gave it away as, as gifts, but I just wanted you all to have it um, because I thought she did such an amazing job with this. And so we're approaching verse four, but I just um, I just thought she did such a great job with this. I just wanted you guys to enjoy it and see it. She's a great artist. Um, so verse four, he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings, you shall take refuge. His truth will be your shield and buckler. So finally to our feathers and, and wings part, um, looking at the time, um, God wants to cover us with his feathers. And just think about, you know, birds protecting their young. Um, think about young little chicks, little bitty chicks. They can't protect themselves. The parent has to keep them warm. The parent has to protect them from anything that would harm them. And today I want you to think about yourself as a helpless little chick. Okay. Um, Brother Lee Stone King always teaches that when you're in the middle of a battle or when you're in the middle of especially people, a people battle, like when people are saying things about you or whatever, he says, you know, think about yourself. Um, think about God's hands and you putting yourself as a little child in God's hands and you pray and you just, you know, say, Lord, you know, here I am. I'm just little, you know, you've got to protect me. You've got to help me. And sometimes when I don't know what to do, that's how I pray. I'm like, Lord, I'm just going to put myself in your hand. And I actually hold up my hands like this and say, Lord, <laughs> I am helpless. I, I cannot do a thing about this. You know, you've got to help me. Um, and I love that throughout the Bible, as I talked about earlier, 
the Lord uses feathers and wings as a symbol of protection throughout the Bible. And a couple of years ago, I, um, what did the millennials say? I geeked out on, um, <laughs> I, on finding all of the feathers and wings, um, all of the examples in the Bible. And I'm not going to do all of those today because let me tell you, there's a whole lot more than what I've given you today. Um, I'm just going to give you a few, but I want you to think about yourself as a helpless little bird. And sometimes we, like the children of God, we are weak in our own strength. And at times we can't defend ourselves. And I've spent a lot of time trying to find out um, all about these feathers and wings. And David used... Um, a lot of these as examples too in Psalms. If you read Psalms, there's a lot of examples of feathers and wings. And, and then there's, if you think about wings, there's a lot of references to wings. So there's eagle wings, dove's wings, angel's wings, cherubim wings. I mean, there's lots and lots of um, symbolism about this throughout the Bible. And I'm just going to give you a few today, um, not to overload you. This is supposed to be an uplifting, encouraging Bible study and not one that you go, ah, She's given me so many verses. Um, Psalm 17, 8, the Lord in Psalm 17, 8 says that he will hide me under the shadow of your wings or hide me under the shadow of your wings. And in Psalm 57, 1, in the shadow of your wings, I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed me by. And so when I think about hiding under the wings of God, you know, I think if there's a huge storm going on, then I can crawl into that little place like that photo that I showed you a minute ago, that little chick. Because if I am under the feathers and wings of God, then I am totally protected. And we're going to get to the, the surround part in a moment. Um, Psalm 61.4, I trust in the shelter of his wings. Remember that word trust again. So remember, I talk to him, I trust, and I touch. And then Deuteronomy 32, 11, this is a metaphor of an eagle thinking about the children of Israel. And let me turn over there really fast. Um, Thirty-two, eleven. So this... And it's talking about the children of Israel and how the Lord protected the children of Israel through the wilderness. And there's a lot here in Deuteronomy 32. This is Moses um, talking to all the assembly of Israel in a song. But as an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings. So the Lord alone led them or him so if you think I mean that's crazy to think about the Lord as this giant eagle and putting the children of Israel on his wings and just carrying them around um but that's what I'm saying I think this topic is just fascinating and then Ruth 2 12 how we come under the wings for refuge Matthew 23, 37, Jesus is talking in Jerusalem and he's in sadness. And he said, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, if you would have allowed me, I would have gathered you like a mother bird gathers her chicks. And what was the Lord saying? He was sad that the people of Jerusalem didn't allow him to protect them, that they didn't want, you know, they wanted to do it their own way. They said, we got this. Thank you very much. We're in charge of our lives we like our own options. Thank you. And so what they did when they said that, they moved themselves out from the fortress, out from the place of the secret place, out from abiding. They moved themselves off of the wings of the eagle and they stood alone. Hello. They stood alone out in the middle of the wilderness by themselves, you know, getting, you know, hit and darts and lightning and hail and rain and everything else and they're saying they're saying what's going on I thought God was supposed to love us well they didn't keep verse one you know of Psalm 91 they didn't put themselves in the secret place of the almighty and they didn't abide in him 
And so then they started getting hit and they were wondering why they were getting hit. I thought God loved me. Well, he does, but you got to remember army crawl it back, back to the fortress. And you got to get back in there to remember God does love us, but he's got principles in place. And we have to follow those principles to be under his wings and under his um, feathers. Everybody good? The little bird again, don't you love that? We've got to be those little chicks, that little chick right there. Okay, verse four. Um, I continued. I got a few more minutes here. So Malachi 4 2, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings to those who fear his name. And if you, I think it's fascinating. I won't go into it today, but to compare Malachi 4 with Matthew 14, 35 through 36. And Matthew, um, it's the lady with the issue of blood. Let me get over here. Matthew 14. Um, so many touched Jesus were made well. And this is even after the lady with the issue of blood. So this is um, Jesus walks on the sea. When they crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. When the men of that place recognized him, they sent out into all that surrounding region brought to him all who were sick and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And many that touched it were made perfectly well. And so that was even after the lady with the issue of blood. And so all they had to do was to touch the hem of his garment. And there's a lot there um, about the connection between Malachi healing in his wings and the garment. I won't get into all that today, but really fascinating so when i think about the wings of god i think okay lord has healing so when i stay under his wings and under his feathers i have healing also um so you know why wings why feathers um i i'm not sure why god chose wings and feathers but i just think that um i talked about the wings of the bible um, again, another stock photo about in the middle of maybe a rainstorm and that duck is saying, you know, don't come over here because this chick is, is, is truly protected and this chick is, is safe right here with me. Um, and then Psalm 35. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. So think about the rest of that verse four. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Again, that takes us back to the armor of God. And so you can also think about the armor. You know, we're supposed to have our shield and then our buckler. Um, and so the Lord and his word, a shield to those who put their trust in him. But again, we have to put our trust in him. And then he becomes our shield and buckler, John 14, 6, God is truth. And so when we think, you know, every word of God is pure, God is truth, he is a shield. And then think about the word buckler. Buckler comes from a word that means to surround. So I, I'm trying to make this mental picture for you today. So if we go all the way back to verse one, he who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide in the shadow of the almighty. And then the fortress, you know, in him I will trust. And so the buckler means to surround. So if God is our buckler, then his wings and his feathers are all around us in the middle of a storm. And so you've got to imagine, I'm going to go to this next one. Yeah, so uh, what happened? Um, so in the middle of a storm, if the Lord is my shield and my buckler, and I am resting under his feathers and his wings, I like to think about it as this. When I am trusting him completely, then he and his word are my shield. So this is in front of me and his shield is in front of me. The feathers and wings are all around me, behind me. And so I am completely surrounded with God, with his promises, you know, as his word is truth. And this is my buckler. And then I've got my shield up. And then his feathers and his wings are all around me. I hope this is 
making sense to you and you understand that this is a mighty, mighty principle of the word. And, but we have to put it into motion. So shield, um, trust, we choose to hold up our shield. We choose to be protected, you know, and to put our trust in God and to use the word of God um, to come against all those fiery darts because I have a misspelling, common sense, do not equal faith. How do you like that? Um, <clears throat> common sense does not equal faith. This drives me nuts. Um, when we are living a life of faith, your circumstances will most likely flatly contradict your faith. And I, it took me a long time because my personality is very, you know, data driven, very analytical, very, you know, I want to check everything out. I want to have all my pieces, you know, all of my ducks in a row before I'm going to believe anything. And so the Lord really likes to mess with me about living a life of faith because I know that um, usually when you're saying you have faith, it looks like everything is just falling apart. And all you can do is back a little closer into those feathers and wings and say, God, I don't know what's going on here, but you do and you're going to see me through this. So just a few more verses. First Peter um, 1, 6 through 9. In this you greatly rejoice through, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And then first, second Corinthians 5, 7, you all know we live by faith, not by sight. And remember, usually if we're living a life of faith, everything we're seeing is contradictory to what God is trying to do, right? And so we can't live by faith. I mean, we can't, we live by faith. We can't live by what we're seeing and we can't live by what we're feeling we have to trust and believe and do this and then we have to be underneath those feathers and wings and in that place of refuge romans 12 12 rejoicing in hope patient and tribulation there's that patient word again patient and tribulation continuing steadfastly in prayer remember in your secret place abiding in the shadow of the most high you've got to be in that secret place um Let me get uh, over here to, okay, Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts, that's a different version than King James, and then um, I think on the next slide I have Isaiah 43, but you know, when you are underneath the wings and the feathers of God, and he is your buckler and you're here, you can't keep writing your own story. You have to give God the pencil and permission to write because when you're backed up and you're like one of those little chicks and you're in the shadow of the most high, sometimes all you can do is give God the pencil and hang on, right? And you have to allow him to write your story. And because if you take the pencil back, then you're going to um, not allow God to fight your battles for you. And I'm going to hurry to a close here. So Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, you all know this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. When you're trusting in him with all of your heart and you're leaning not on your own understanding, you're just being like a little bird. Lord, protect me, carry me on your wings. You know, you've got to hunker down like a bird, allow God to cover you with his feathers. You've got to take up your shield of faith, allow Jesus to fight off the fiery darts. And then the last, um, I'm going to say last verse, Isaiah 43, 
But now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Neither shall the flames scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored. I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. So I've got to remember that God is going to be with me. And through feathers and through wings, God shows me how much he loves us, how much he loves each of us so much. And he is going to be with me. He's going to be with me through the water. He's going to be with me through the fire. But I've got to stay in that secret place. I've got to abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And I've got to stay tucked in underneath the Lord and underneath his provision.